Welcome back. And now for something entirely different. Three stocks from Roger Montgomery, which are bound to be very different from what we've heard so far. Because, as we know, Roger's very different as well. Roger, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. I'm glad our returns are very different too, <laughs> to everyone else's. I knew you'd come up with something like that. Listen, yes. um, I, I put the challenge out to you. And, uh, and by the way, every, before we get to it, every time I, I, I see a new story around I sent you, I always think of you because you're one of the first to, to yes. alert us to it. Do you still like us? Still like it. It's one of the three stocks yeah. I wanted to talk about tonight. Oh, OK. Um, there's, there's it, some... There was a bit of pressure on it a couple of weeks, months yeah, ago. Yeah, there was some commentary that had come out. Some, someone had done some analysis on a blog somewhere, mm. quite literally, and, uh, and said that they were actually disguising the fact that their return on equity was deteriorating and that their um, local business was mature mm. uh, and they were reinvesting in acquisitions in Asia but these were small and they weren't getting the same return yeah. as what they were getting on the main business. Mm. So we, you know, we comprehensively dismissed that yeah. and, uh, and point by point. Mm. Um, in fact, what's actually happening is, yes, they are growing by acquiring smaller businesses in Asia, but what we know is that their average revenue per customer, which is on a very a much lower base in Asia because labour is so much cheaper there, so companies can do some of that work themselves, yeah, right. um, it is growing substantially. Meanwhile, in Australia, where they have really 90% market share and they're the dominant provider in who, who Australia. Who is their other rival? Is, is it AAP? AA, AA, well, no, not really. I don't think there really is now no. doing everyone. They've just bought King Content, which also means that they're generating content for their mm. clients now as well. But their average revenue per customer has grown from 20, circa $23,000 um, a year uh, when they floated and they were forecasting sort of circa $27,000 average revenue per customer. It's already over 33000 That's only right. in two years yep. or three years. Um, as I say, in Asia, it's about a third of that, but it's again, grow or sorry, half of that, but growing um, very quickly. And and their churn, their, their customer churn is very, very low. We love businesses where they can increase their prices and suffer no detrimental impact on unit sales volume. Mm. They're growing their customers while they're increasing prices. Was the election right. good for them? Any news event is good mm. for any business mm. that they're, 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 who are their customers. Yeah. And, and, and what's really interesting is, in fact, the top 50 customers have an average tenure of 11 years. They've been there that long. Yeah. So stable business, yeah. um, still reasonably priced now following that sell-off that you referred to, yeah. uh, and so one that we like. Okay. So that's one, that's one of your three. That's one, yeah. Number two. Number two, uh, realestate.com uh, or REA Group. Mm. Mm. Um, very, very interesting business. Let's let's take a step back from REA for a minute and just talk about the market mm. um, of selling houses in Australia. $6.5 billion uh, is spent marketing homes, residential real estate, in Australia every year. It's a fairly consistent number, is it? It's, it, it, it's actually been growing mm. slightly. Um, uh, but out of that $6.5 billion, 85% of it goes to real estate agents and 5% goes to REA Group. Now, we would argue, this is our thesis, mm. we would argue that a agents bring something less than 85% of the value in a transaction. And I don't know what number that is, how much less, but something less. Yeah. And REA, something more than 5%. Yeah, given, given, given the fact that most right? people, when they start looking for a property... Go to REA yeah, to yeah. look. Yeah. OK, so, so if you're marketing a house, and let's say you've got a marketing budget of $30,000, REA capture $1,500 of that or thereabouts. <clears throat> so if they increase their prices by 10%, it's only $150 more. Mm. You're not really going to... You're not going to say as a customer, I'm not going to advertise my property mm. on REA because they've just raised it by 150 bucks. Mm. And so we think there's a big runway of price increases that they can effect mm. uh, without detrimentally impacting their unit sales volume. Have, in, in working out your, your view on REA, have you also done the analysis on its biggest rival, Domain? Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, yeah, I can refer to that. Yeah. So, so Domain are actually in Increasing. So when you look at, um, uh, since 2013, uh, if you have a look at total listings in Australia, and it's split between REA and Domain, REA's has been declining slightly and, and Domain's been increasing slightly. Mm -hmm. They're converging. 
And you might initially think that's something to be concerned about, but in actual fact what's happening is people are just advertising on both now. Mm. Whereas previously they might have in, in only advertised on one, mm. now they're increasingly advertising on both. Mm. Reason being, it's becoming more competitive to sell your property. In a boom property market, a lot of properties weren't even listed because an agent would say, yeah, I've got someone ready to buy that property. Now we'll start a Dutch auction and off we go. Yeah. Don't even have to list it. And we saw at the peak of the boom in property, the average listing days in Sydney, I think, was 24 days. Mm. Well, that's expanding again now. Mm. And so when property booms become mature, which it now is in Australia, then it, there are more properties being listed, so they make more money. Mm. Um, and, and so we think the company's going to make more money from a maturing property market from more property listings and they're also going to make more money because the, the proportion of highlight ads, which are what they call their depth ads, so the premier, mm. premier or premium ads, yeah. and you know, they've got gold and platinum and all the different classes, um, the proportion of people who are paying for that is actually increasing. So you've got growth on growth and then they're raising prices, and they just raised prices by 10 to 15% on July 1. No detrimental impact on unit sales volume. So that's growth on growth on growth. And even in the absence of those things, net profit after tax, earnings per share and revenue have all been growing over the last And given years. the fact there's really only two players in the market, mm. it's, a, it's a duopoly, and REO is going to be a price leader, and Domain's going to basically follow them. I would have thought so. Yeah. Okay. I would have thought so. Okay, yeah, okay. number three. And the last one... Uh, I'll Don't say challenger. No, no, I've said that one I know you have. I know. still like it. I know, I, I thought still you like would. It. I thought I'd give you yeah. a new one. Yeah, good. The reason why we, we think we've had the opportunity... You, you could have said Challenger, by the way, because right. if it's, it's still a good company... You, I, you've I, said it now anyway, yeah, so it's yeah. covered. <laughs> yeah. um, give them four. Uh, so, um, so this one has, has had a chequered past. Mm. It's a company called HealthScope. Um, yeah, it has right? it. Okay. They had a chequered past. They were in pathology. Mm. They were in medical centres. They were in aged care and hospitals. Then in and, 2010... And they, had, they, had, they had their doctors desperate to sell out once the escrow was over as well. All of that. All, All of that, that. With yeah. happen, which happens with roll-ups, with any yeah. roll-ups. So yeah. Be very careful yeah. with roll-ups. Then private Especially equity... Especially white-collar professionals. Private equity took it off the market in 2010, relisted right. it in 2014. Well, private equity, that scares people. It sure does. Mm. And, uh, and, and sometimes justifiably, but not always. You know, right. I think anything that Chris Hadley... Um, puts out from Quadrant is worth looking at. Okay. Um, I think he does an ex extraordinary job mm. um, with a lot of integrity. Anyway, um, uh, so so here's a business. Here's a business that is now focusing on hospitals. Okay. Um, and on the northern beaches, well, it's not really the northern beaches, but French's Forest or Forestville. No, it's close, um, to the close enough. You yeah. can smell the salt from there, can't <laughs> yeah. you, if you can't see it? Well, some um, will blow across. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Uh, and, and, you know, they're building a hospital. Okay. Now, 450 beds, 60% uh, of that. Uh, is going to be public and 40% of it of those beds will be private beds. The government is helping with the funding of the construction of the pr public part mm. of that business. Yeah. And we think the long-run trajectory of that hospital and the economics of hospitals, mm. we also own, have owned Ramsey, mm. um, we think are very, very good. We think the business is cheap. And the only reason why we think in the healthcare space, which is obviously a thematic that everyone gets yeah. you know, with an yeah. ageing population, yeah. the only reason we've been able to even look at it at, at a price that we think approximates value um, is because of the chequered past that it's had, and so people are relatively dismissive of it. Mm, okay. So, what I know when you analyse something, you you analyse what what can go right, but what could go wrong is is also something you'd, you'd analyse. Sure. W what would be the the biggest threat to health scope? Do you think? Uh, I think a proliferation of beds, mm. which is highly unlikely. unlikely. Yeah. Um, I think changes to Medicare, which might mean that hospitals get one up or insurers get one up on the hospitals, mm. uh, uh, doctors get one up or the insurers get one up on the hospitals. Mm. But that all seems to have stabilised again now. Mm. Um, you know, there was a little bit of movement there and the insurers were putting the spotlight on uh, on overcharging for things like prosthetics. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and how can it be that... Uh, one doctor can charge $200 for a procedure and another doctor $2,000. Mm. That's all gone a little bit quiet again because I think the government's worked out that we need a stable sector. Mm. We need stable insurers and profitable insurers, obviously, mm. particularly in the private private insurance space. Um, and hospitals need to make money as well in mm. order to provide good care. So it's sort of stabilised. OK, it's interesting. HealthScope as a company can be rather insensitive to the economic cycle. Well, yes. In fact, I, I privately um, made an investment earlier this year in a hospital REIT. 
uh, mm. in an unlisted property trust in Australia, uh, in Australia run mm. by Australian Unity. Mm. Uh, it had a circa 10% running yield and I looked at the property portfolio and I thought, gee, if this was listed, the property portfolio would be 40%, 30-40% higher mm. uh, than where it is. But shortly after I invested, they closed it to new, mm. new investors. Mm. And what's interesting about that is even during the GFC, and this goes to your point, um, even during the GFC, the volatility of that sector, hospital real estate investment trusts, mm sort of 3% volatility, you know, mm. very, very low volatility. Roger, before you go, uh, this market rally, Yes. clearly you're, you, you enjoy a rally if you, sure. you bought shares at lower prices and all that sort of stuff. Has it surprised you in a sense post-Brexit that the reaction has been well, positive rather than negative? Brexit, I always thought Brexit would be a speed hump, mm. irrespective of what the outcome was. Mm. Um, I don't even, I'm not even convinced that they'll actually manage to leave. I don't know how they're going to negotiate closed borders and mm. open trade, but we'll mm. leave that aside. Mm. Um, the bigger issue is that you've got a stock market that's rallying. Stock markets cast their shadow before them, which tends to suggest that the economy's going well, yeah. but you've got a bond market that's rallying yeah. as well, and yeah. interest rates going down, mm. which suggests things aren't well. Mm. What I think is happening is the only justification for buying stocks broadly, and I mean the index, um, is that interest rates are low because mm. there's no growth. Sure? There's no growth through debt because debt's too high. There's very little growth from retained earnings because payout ratios have been increasing over the last five years. And so if there's no growth, what justifies higher prices, lower interest rates? And I just, I've got a sneaking suspicion that lower interest rate, the, the bond market mm. rally that we're seeing, the bond market is no longer providing a proper price signal for risk no. and a proper price signal but for... But is that return. part of the reason because the, the demand for government bonds from all the central banks trying to flood the world with liquidity... Cash. Indeed. Make, ...makes this episode of the bond market very unusual compared to other ones. Well, it's the most extreme monetary experiment I think we'll see in that's our right. lifetime. That's right. Because in previous times, if the bond market was going, was you're showing yields going down and bond prices up, you think, OK, there could be something really crappy going on in the, in the well, future. Well, think about Italy. Italy's got $400 billion of non-performing loans in their banking system. That's 25% mm. of their GDP. Mm. That banking system should be bailed out, and yet the government today can borrow at lower rates than when things were good. That tells you that the bond market is mm. not providing an appropriate signal for risk. Mm. And at some point... At some point, it will start to reflect risk properly. So, do you see? Do you, but do you see yourself at one point looking at all the external signals and say, "It's time for me to, to reduce my exposure to the market." Well, we've got 25% cash. The but you were bigger than before, weren't you? No, no, we were. 25 20, is your maximum. 20. We're now 25 okay. and approaching 26, yeah. uh, and uh, and that's creeping up over time. Mm. That hasn't. It's a drag on our returns, but our returns are still double digits. Mm. We still generate double digit returns with that cash, and I think that's going to be an option over lower prices if they eventuate. Yeah. Okay, mate. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Peter. Roger Montgomery.